Hello everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome you here today. And I hope everyone is doing well. And, uh, today I want to talk to you about something that is often overlooked in the church today. Uh, and that is the spiritual battle that we entered into when we accepted Christ as our Savior. Uh, let's pray before we begin. Um, Heavenly Father, I invite you into this time of study. I ask that you would speak through me by your, by your Holy Spirit. And help us to internalize and implement all that we learn here today. In Jesus' name I pray this. Amen. We are at war. You ever feel like you're under attack all the time? I know I do. Sometimes that we're constantly battling ourselves, unbelievers, and the lies all around us. That's because we have three enemies talked about in the scriptures. The flesh, the world, and the devil. Today I want to talk to you about this spiritual war that we find ourselves in. As soon as you become a follower of Christ, you became a soldier in the Lord's army. You became a soldier behind enemy lines. When we accepted Christ as our Savior, we are joined with Him. We paid our sin debt and we received His righteousness. Positionally before God, it is as if we have never sinned. Although nothing can cause us to lose our salvation, the reality of sin remains, and so do the consequences that come in this life from bad decisions and ungodly living. When we received the gift of righteousness of Christ, something special happened to us. Uh, David Jeremiah explains it this way. He says that Christ became our righteousness, and when we trust him as Savior, we are clothed in him. Then when God looks at us, he doesn't see us in our sins. He sees us clothed in the righteousness of Christ. That is our position before God. When we accepted Christ Jesus as our Savior, we were taken from being captive by the devil, blinded by his deceptions of unbelief, and we were transferred into the army of light. Rest assured, the Christian life is not merely a religious belief, a social club, or something to make you feel good and prosperous, as some like to preach. It is a battleground, a battle for the hearts, minds, and ultimately the souls of every human on earth. But rest assured that God is fighting this battle right beside us, and he has given us all we need to overcome the enemies we are about to discuss. As I mentioned before, we have three main enemies in our lives as Christians. The first of these enemies Paul talks about is the flesh. The flesh is largely driven by our own sinful nature, our own sinful desires, which the devil knows well and will use to tempt us at every opportunity. You know, in scriptures it talks about the old man and the new man and becoming a new creation in Christ. And when we accept Christ as our Savior, we become a new creation. Our desires begin to change, our thinking begins to change. But we still have that old nature lurking inside of us trying to uh, battle against the new nature that we have in Christ. And when we have the desire to do these things, we know we shouldn't do. We are dealing with the sinful nature we received from Adam. We're dealing with the flesh. In Galatians 5, 15 and 17, it says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the desire of the flesh is against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, in order to keep you from doing whatever you want. When we became believers, we received the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit begins to work in our lives to conform us to the likeness of Christ. We began to see the world and ourselves differently. It began what is called the process of sanctification. This is the process by which the Holy Spirit uses to create Christ-like characteristics within us. If you are a believer, you are in the spirit rather than in the flesh. But in order to combat the flesh, we need to feed the spirit. We do this by being in the word of God, listening to sermons, reading devotionals, listening to Christian music, Christ, Christian music and watching movies with Christian themes and messages, spending time in fellowship with one another, and setting our minds on godly things. The most important of these is getting the Word of God into our hands, our heads, and our hearts. 
It is imperative that we learn scripture. This is God's primary way of talking to us. Have you ever been faced with a difficult decision and it had a relevant scripture come to mind showing you the right path to take? I happen, I happen to have this happen to me when an old friend picked me up to go to work with him. We weren't on the road long before he pulled out a bottle of booze and began drinking as he drove. He then began talking about how we were going to con these people into letting us do work for them by going door to door. A proverb kept coming to my mind, warning me that this was not the place to be. Proverbs 1, 10 through 14 says, My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie in wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without cause. Let's swallow them alive like Sheol, even whole like those who go down to the pit. We, all, we will find all kinds of precious wealth. We will fill our houses with plunder. Throw in your lot with us. We will all have one money bag. This proverb kept coming to my mind, and I was like, I need to go home right now. Having the word in our minds will guard us in times of trouble when we may not be able to look up verses. That verse coming to my mind was God's way of telling me I needed to get out of that situation. All it would take was getting caught up in his schemes to destroy all I had worked for. It can be incredibly easy for one foolish choice to destroy our lives, our families, and our ministries. We must be very careful not to make poor choices that could cause irreparable harm in our lives. Now Galatians 5, 19 through 21, tell us what the deeds of the flesh are and the result of feeding the flesh. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are sexual immorality, impurity, indecent behavior, idolatry, witchcraft, hostility, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Like gardening, whatever we care for, cultivate, and fertilize is what will grow and become stronger. Believe me, the world has fertilizer everywhere we turn. If you watch movies filled with the qualities described here, then that will be what will influence our thinking. The constant bombardment of divisive media, sexuality, and violence. Do you ever watch the news or read news articles and then become consumed with thinking about politics, the, ide the ideology of the world, and the lies the media spews? I know it can grab hold of us and rob us of joy, peace, and keep us focused on our next enemy, the world. Colossians 3.2 says, set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on the earth. We need to set our minds on the things above, not on the things of this world. We are to be in this world, but not of this world. Personally, I've had to delete apps from my phone, cut out politics, YouTube, Facebook, news stories, anything that produces or encourages these traits of the flesh to grow within me. And that robs our time away from the things above. I would start reading news articles and then start reading the comments. Pretty soon I'm arguing with people about the topic, upset, consumed with arguing about something that God said before the world began, replaying these arguments over and over, meditating on these issues and not the word of God. I had a friend who was telling me how she was filled with fear and anxiety all the time. Come to find out, she would watch horror films every day. She insisted that wasn't the cause though. Just like your body reacts to what you feed it, your mind does as well. So if we feed our minds with things that lead to the deeds of flesh, our minds will naturally produce these thoughts. We can't grow apples by planting orange seeds. So in order to reap the rewards of the Spirit, we must plant the seeds of the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 through 25 shows us what this fruit looks like. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let's follow the Spirit as well. 
I can't think of any of us that would rather have the works of the, the deeds of the flesh over the fruits of the spirit. Don't we all want love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness? We must be on guard as to what we're planting in our minds. We become desensitized to sin when we are constantly reinforcing that is not wrong, that it is not wrong through media and television. As we feed the spirit and renew our minds with the things of God, we will see these traits growing within us. Remember, it is a process, not perfection. Sanctification takes time, so be patient with yourself, but also be proactive. Now this brings us to our next enemy, the world. We are continuously bombarded by the beliefs of the world. We must remember that our greatest enemy is at this time the ruler of the world. He controls many of our political leaders and the media. He uses movies, music, television, and political division to influence us to think the way that he wants us to. Have you ever been singing your favorite song and realized that the song was actually saying what the song was actually saying? You're just singing along with this great tune and then you realize it glorifies drugs, violence, crime, and all manner of evil. These things creep into our minds without us even realizing it. I remember when I was kind of a jerk of a teenager and I used to sing these insulting little songs to my coworkers. I know, I know, I was young and foolish. But as long as I sang these insults to a happy little tune, they never even said anything. I don't even know if they noticed what I was actually saying about them. That's how the devil works in our world. Subtly painting, planting evil, wrapped in a happy little tune, or a seemingly harmless story. Now, if you look at the world, it doesn't take very long to find out and to notice how much of in opposition to God the world is. I mean, you look everywhere, there's drugs and alcohol and violence and sex and and uh, all manner of evil things that go on in the world. They always have since the fall. And it's just gotten progressively worse and worse. And if we look in Revelations, we see that it's beyond repair. You know, we're not in this world to fix the world. We're in it to rescue those who are caught up in it, to bring those people out of the world and into the kingdom of light. In Romans 12, it says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove that the will of God is that which is good and per acceptable and perfect. So as Paul tells us here, we need to fill our minds with the truth found in God's word and not in the lies that permeate every aspect of the world around us. We are living in a world that continues to convince us that evil is good that good is evil. It permeates the media, and if we dare say something or someone is wrong, then we are deemed intolerant, hateful, or phobic. They market abortion as something good for society. We live in a postmodern Christian society that refutes the notion that there is an objective truth, that there is right and wrong. Rather than recognizing God's word as the ultimate source of authority, they themselves are their own source of authority. They claim that everyone has their own truth. And everyone's truth is just as valid. People are losing jobs and being persecuted for standing up to the realities that lie of life that make some feel uncomfortable. Scripture says they all did what was right in their own eyes. Yet we are called to love all people as Christ does. We need not point fingers, judge, and be angry at them. Bringing the truth to them is our mission in this world. God says he wishes no one for that reason, we must speak the truth in love, recognizing that pe these people are prisoners of war, blinded and held captive by our third enemy, the devil, just as many of us were before coming to know the truth. In his book, David Jeremiah gives us some insight into what is happening in the world around us right now, when he says, it is therefore possible to be led astray by our conscience. If we are deceived about what is right and what is wrong, it is important to understand that our conscience must be informed by the word of God, by what it says is right and what it says is wrong. 
We see it see we see it more and more these days. Even believers are becoming confused about what is right and what is not. We are divided in every area of life. This is the work of the devil who can only hurt God through the people he loves so much. Now the devil began his rebellion in heaven long ago, when through his pride he led a third of the angels to follow him instead of God because he wanted to be God. He does the same to those who do not believe. He deceives them and turns them against God. Have you ever noticed how angry some unbelievers are at the idea of God? They have been leaving the lies of the devil. They work so hard for their own demise, and they don't even know it. But to the Christian, he is seeking to destroy our testimonies, our reputations, and our perception of God. His tools are deception, lies, doubts, discouragement, depression. He attacks our self-worth, tempting us to behave in a way that is ungodly, ways that will destroy our jobs, our families, our ministries, and our lives. He knows that he cannot hurt God or even touch him. So his only weapon to hurt God is through the lives of us, his children. In Ephesians 6.12, it tells us, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. In this verse, we see that it is not the confused people that are our enemies. This verse talks about rankings of demons that follow the devil and rule the powers of this world. You can be sure that the devil has a strategy and has a well-planned out battle plan to come against us, to destroy us, to deceive us, to lead us astray. His rebellion started long ago in heaven, where his pride and his desire to be better than what God had for him led him to want to take God's place in heaven. When he rebelled, he took one third of the angels with him. These angels are now fallen, demons who do the bidding of the devil. And they are all working together in concert to come against us as believers. First Peter 5 8 tells us, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Now God says sex is between a husband and wife. The devil says it's an orgy for anyone. Love is love. God says he created us male and female. The devil says you can be whatever you want to be. God says our identity is in the righteousness of Christ. The devil says our identity is in our sin. Ephesians 6 gives us a model of how we are to combat these enemies of ours. Therefore, take up the full armor of God, so that you will be able to resist on the evil day. And having done everything to stand firm, stand firm therefore, having belted your waist with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having strapped on your feet the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. The belt of truth is what holds all of our armor together. It is the truth found in the word of God. If I know, for example, that the shirt I'm wearing is blue, no one and nothing can convince me that it is red. When we know the truth, lies will have no power over us. The breastplate of righteousness is first the righteousness given us by our union with Christ, and secondly, right living, so that we will not give the devil ammunition against our character and our integrity. On our feet, the shoes of the gospel of peace. We must be prepared to share the gospel message with everyone we encounter. Remember, God wants all to be saved above all else. As we are immersed in the word of God, and the knowledge of God and our rightness before him, we will have faith in God that will protect us from the devil's attacks. The helmet of salvation is our assurance of the salvation we have in Christ. The devil will try to make you miserable by convincing you that you're not good enough, that we're not saved, but our salvation rests in the finished work of cross on the cro Christ on the cross, 
not on our own works. All of these things are found in the word of God, the sword of the spirit. This is our only offensive weapon. Just as the Lord used, it is written. When the devil tried to deceive him, we too must know the word of God so that this armor will guard our hearts, minds, and souls. We must also continuously be in prayer, in communication with our Lord, to give us guidance and direction in our lives as we traverse the dangerous ideas that assault us in every way. I'll leave you with another quote from David Jeremiah that gives us insight into how we must walk in this fallen world. When we find little ways of lying, cheating, and shading the truth, it gives Satan a foothold in our hearts. Nothing so demoralizes and discourages a warrior as being involved in a spiritual battle, knowing there is a problem with character and integrity in his own life. The little sins we tolerate represent dangerous holes in our bulletproof vests. You can be sure that sooner or later, Satan will aim right at one of these spots. In conclusion, we must watch what we fill our minds with. Ask ourselves how we are using our time, what are we taking into our minds, and what is our source of authority. These three enemies of ours are closely related and are tools that the devil uses to try to wedge himself between us and God. He is a master of spin, turning evil to good, and good to evil. We must be on guard, closely monitoring our thoughts and filtering everything through the word of God. The only way we can stand against these enemies is with Christ on our side. If there is anyone out there that has not trusted in Jesus as their Savior, I implore you to come forward, talk with our counselors, and ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Thank you for giving us your word, your wisdom, and showing us what is wrong in our lives. Thank you for giving us the power and the tools to combat these enemies we face. Please strengthen us and protect us as we face the influences that continuously come against us. May we strengthen each other as we live in a manner that pleases you. Help us to recognize the subtle attacks of the enemy on our minds and our emotions. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to thank everyone for coming out and, and uh, hope everyone has a good week. Drive safely and uh, hopefully we'll see you back next week. Thank you.